All right. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Michael Acton Smith. I run a game studio in London called Mind Candy. And uh, we've had uh, a few games bubbling away, but our, our biggest by far, our monster hit has been something called uh, Moshi Monsters. Um, so that's Mind Candy. This is Moshi Monsters. I, um, I've never been to MIT before. I don't know much about the TV industry. I should probably admit that up front, but I, I do know a. a Michael, yeah. No, sorry. I got to get this thing right by those mics because you don't oh, have a live ones. one. Okay. Yeah, sorry. All right. Is that better? Can you all hear me now? Yeah, that's a lot better. Thank Fantastic. You. Okay. So. Um, just apologizing that I don't know much about the TV industry, but um, I know lots about games. And uh, Moshi Monster is a, a game that we developed uh, a few years ago, and uh, it's um, a Flash-based uh, browser game that has, um, has become a bit of a phenomenon. So it's sort of a, a cross between Tamagotchi and Facebook for kids. And uh, let me show you the, the graph that makes my investors very happy. Um, so we launched it in 2008, and we bubbled along um, for the first year or so, and then we hit our tipping point in the summer of 2009, and things really took off um, ridiculously. Uh, we've got almost 40 million registered users around the world in 200 countries. We add one new sign-up every second, and uh, it's also very profitable. Uh, it's a subscription model. Um, I hate this phrase, but freemium, whereby most players play for free, but then uh, a certain number um, of parents sign their children up for the subscription uh, side of things where they unlock new parts of the world. Sort of 5 to 11 is the kind of core audience, and uh, pretty split between uh, girls and boys. So um, this is what, what Moshi is, basically. This is the, the home page to the site. And kids can do an awful lot within the world. They can play games. There are educational puzzles. Um, there are missions they can go on, there are stories they can write, and uh, we've had a lot of success online, and so we thought we'd take the brand offline, and um, uh, we've launched books and toys and magazines and, and video games, and this has all happened incredibly quickly. This is the wonderful thing about the web. If you catch the magic and you create something that consumers love, it can become huge very, very quickly. So um, two years ago, we were teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. I couldn't make payroll at the end of the month. And now we'll do about $100 million in uh, gross um, sales of Moshi Monsters products this year. So it's been a, it's been a bit of a crazy journey. Uh, when I was a kid, I got a pet rock. Don't know if anyone remembers this. Um, a very low-tech uh, virtual pet. Um, but over the years, there's been more sophisticated ones, Tamagotchis and Furbies. And uh, what I wanted to do was create a more emotionally resonant, uh, beautifully animated little virtual pet that lived online for, for kids to, to look after. And this is the first sketch that I, I ever did. Um, so just very briefly on the user journey, kids sign up and adopt a, a little monster, and they choose its color scheme, and they give it a name, and then it lives within a house. And the house is empty, and uh, they can feed their pet and take it for walks and, and look after it. And uh, one of the things that keeps children coming back that we're very proud of is the educational side of Moshi. So we have 35 different puzzle games within the world, uh, testing everything from logic and maths and different languages. And uh, they're designed like games, so kids don't think they're learning. And uh, parents are very happy for their kids to, to play them. Um, and then kids, depending on how well they do, and they compare their scores with their friends, they get rocks, which is the in-game currency, which enables them to go shopping, which they love. And they can go to the grocery store to buy food. Uh, they can go to Yakia to buy furniture. Uh, if they have a lot of rocks, they can go to Horrods, uh, which is the, uh, the exclusive shop. Um, then they can play many mini games. There's a, a dancing game, top right. And then bottom left is uh, a monster's room where kids customize it. They personalize it exactly as they like. Uh, one of the most popular parts of the game, bottom right, is where they can plant seeds in their garden to attract uh, these little creatures, which are moshlings, a sort of a, a virtual pet for your virtual pet, which sounds a bit bizarre, but um, kids absolutely love that. Uh, they're sort of like um, Pokemon mixed with uh, the cuteness of Hello Kitty, and they've all got a backstory, and uh, um, some are rare, some are, some are very, very common. So this is what a room looks like, and, and basically a lot of kids' virtual worlds copied uh, Club Penguin and some of the, the early successful um, virtual worlds, and our DNA is more aligned with Facebook. Um, this is uh, 
sort of um, what a kid's, an under 13 year old uh, virtual world looks like, we think, uh, but obviously safe. So there are gifts that kids can send each other, they can rate each other's room, they can send each other safe messages. And that graph I showed at the start when we hit the tipping point, the penny drop moment for us was when we realized that kids love to communicate and show off and share online just as much as grown-ups do. And if we could build a safe uh, community and give them the tools to do that, we could build effectively the, the Facebook for kids. And uh, these are some of the key social features that we've got within the world. So the next thing we're launching, I'll come on to that in a second, is um, Moshi TV. Uh, kids love playing games online, but they also love watching videos. And we're creating an online video player that will allow kids to watch video and uh, we've got uh, over 7 million monthly unique visitors every month, and uh, that's getting up there with some of the major broadcasters. So the key twist to what we're doing is that the social layer is wrapped around it. So kids can watch shows with their friends, they can comment on shows that they love. Uh, if they like a show, uh, they can um, publish that to their news feed, so the virality can kick in. And uh, it sits somewhere between traditional broadcast and the infinite channels of, of YouTube. There'll be some curation, uh, we'll create some content, we'll encourage the kids to create content, and we're also very keen to speak to creatives and producers that want to show off and show their work on our platform. But as I say, we think it's really, really exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, traditionally broadcasters decide what content goes on their limited slots on traditional TV. And um, with a model like this, kids will effectively decide. The good stuff will bubble up and the stuff they don't like so much uh, will disappear. So last, uh, last couple of slides now. Um, we're introducing Story into the world. This is Dr. Strangelove uh, and his army of glumps. He kidnapped Lady Goo Goo recently and the kids are... Uh, the kids are playing various uh, missions to try and uh, figure out what's going on, but this, this kind of mixes short form animation with puzzles, uh, with point and click adventures, and uh, kids are absolutely loving it. It changed our, our, um, all our key metrics when we launched this recently. They sign up to become a super moshi and uh, go on these adventures. So um, this was the first sketch that I did uh, many years ago on the back of a napkin when Moshi Online started to take off. And the key, the heartbeat of the property is the website. And as I said at the start, it changes everything. So different to having the heartbeat as a TV show or a film. We can connect directly with our 37, 38 million uh, members via email. They can come onto the site and connect with each other. They don't have to wait for their favorite show to come on at a certain time on TV. And so around this, we're building all sorts of other uh, media and on different platforms, as I mentioned, from books to, to iPhone apps and so forth. So some people get this, but not everyone does. The internet is about to turn the kids' entertainment industry upside down. And I uh, just want to leave you with one final thought uh, in my last 30 seconds. The most successful kids' properties of tomorrow will originate online. You can create stuff that your audience wants because you can look at all the data rather than what you think they want. And I think that uh, is pretty exciting for creators and also for the, the kids themselves. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to ask you a few quick questions. If you want to grab a mic. You don't have to sit down. We're d I don't know why they put chairs on here. We should just be standing all day. You know what I'm saying? Word. Um, okay. <laughs> I am so hip in the hood. So, you know, the, the biggest, you've, have you been pitching? No, it's, it's on, it's on, it's on. Yeah. Okay. Um, you've been pitching this to broadcasters. If you guys want to come up and, um, and change over the, do you want to do the change right now? Can you bring up who's next? Is it Michael? Yeah, is Yoni coming up next? Okay, because I have a, okay. Yoni, if you could make it happen real quick, that'd be awesome. Um, I'm such a director. It's crazy. When do you, when you went in, have you pitched this to the broadcasters? Um, not really, because, uh, you know. Because you have TV in there, but you don't sort of follow through on it enough. Well, we, we're building our own platform. So we see this as, um, you know, an alternative to the broadcasters, um, whereby uh, rather than kids sitting on a sofa and being broadcast to, this digital generation of kids uh, wants to interact with content. They want to remix it, they want to pause it, they want to share it with their friends instantly. And uh, we think an online platform makes a lot more sense. But I'm a bit confused. In, the, in, the, in the, the, all the circles, you had TV in there. So is TV ah. coming afterwards or? Well, we may create a, we are going to create an animated series, but we're, we think it's much more natural that that sits online, um, you know, either on YouTube or Moshi TV, and it may go on traditional.
traditional broadcast TV so as well. So when you say TV, you're not actually talking about traditional broadcasters. You're talking about online TV. Yeah, well, t TV to me means, and maybe this isn't the best definition, but it's just being able to watch content on any platform, whether it be an iPad or um, on a traditional box TV or um, uh, online. What has been your biggest challenge to date? Like, what is really through you a loop? If people out here are thinking of doing this and they're saying, you know what, I've got a kid's property, I could do something like this, what, what, would, what sort of advice would you give them? What's the biggest challenge? It's, it's very tough. You know, the first game we launched, uh, we raised $10 million. Uh, we lost $9 million of it, and uh, our investors were not too happy. That was Perplex City, That was right? Perplex City, yeah. Very Fantastic. If you ever get a chance, go to the Mind Candy website, click on Perplex City. <laughs> I played this when I lived in the UK. Um, you had to find a $100,000 cube located somewhere. There were parties. It was an alternative reality game, the best I've ever seen. I actually went into Waterstones, which is one of the – you bought little cards. You scrubbed off the card, <laughs> and you had to figure out these mathematical equations. You typed those equations into the website. It gave you free – it gave you a, 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 um, a location to go to. You would get things sent to you. There was one party in which it took, a, it took place on the top of, like, an apartment building, and it was – a helicopter came down and threw out <laughs> – like, no wonder you guys blew through nine million. Absolutely. Helicopters are expensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, no, creatively, it was extraordinary. One of the most amazing things I've done. Commercially, it didn't work. We realized consumers didn't, or people didn't want to have their entertainment so fragmented and one linear story running across all these platforms. Um, but we've learned a lot from it. And with our last million dollars and our final roll of the dice, we made Moshi work. So in answer to your question, the biggest challenge um, has just been trying to hold on to the, the rocket ship and and uh, hire, you know, we're hiring like crazy. So if anyone is excited by what we're up to, we'd love to speak to you. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Darren. On licensing deals, is sitting in the front row here, and would love Darren to right there, chat to licensing to partners you. too. So <laughs> great, thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. Cheers, guys. We have up next um, the co-founder and CEO of Interlude, Yoni Bloch. Go ahead. Well, I don't know. I, I, wh how do you say your name? Bloch. Okay, I got it. No, that's much nicer, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Good luck. Um, so hi, I'm uh, Yoni, I'm from Tel Aviv. I'm uh, actually, I'm uh, a relatively known singer in Tel Aviv. I've got three albums and my first two were gold, but in Israel it's very easy because it's a small country, so you need to sell only 20,000 to get to that, so it's not a big deal. Um, my connection to the television industry um, in Israel is that I was uh, also a judge on the Israeli version of American Idol. I was the nice judge, the Randy. And uh, this company started about uh, uh, two years ago when I had an idea to make an uh, interactive music video for myself. Um, I heard the thing interactive, music, interactive videos in general for a long time, but I had this obvious idea of what it's supposed to be and I didn't see anyone doing it. Um, I had a big uh, history of doing a lot of uh, music videos in Israel. And the idea was, was very simple. It all started because I saw that people have much less patience to, uh, to watch videos online and to see, um, for example, when I released a music video, the statistics are always that people don't even see the vid videos until the end. So what we try to say is that in the beginning, when there was only radio, people were only listening to music. Came the TV, the medium changed, and we had visuals. But when the internet came, online videos haven't changed at all. They stay the same videos, just online. So we have a very, very simple concept, which says that on a static timeline in predefined points, users will have choices that are real time on the video and when they make them, they change both the audio and the video on a narrative way. So we shot a video to demonstrate this. Um, this is my uh, bass player apartment in Southern Tel Aviv. It's the slums where the musicians live. So as you can see, it starts out just like any other uh, video. But as we get to the second verse, 
those this guy and this girl this girl this guy let's uh, click on the guy and I give him the headphones and now we're following him if I would have clicked on her she goes to a completely different room and completely different things happen to her but to see them you have to play it again so now he comes in with this cheap uh, cheap bottle of champagne and we can choose between his uh, geek friend and his alcoholic friend of course we'll click on the alcoholic girl yes of course and now the music changes too there's girls singing in the background if I would have chosen him there would be guys singing in the background now this is the educational part of the video Now we can choose between white and black. I'll go with white. Now this video was, one, was shot over one night, both in English and in Hebrew. There are 256 different combinations you can make. Because everything happens in real time in a seamless way, if you don't make a choice, it will make a choice for you. Either randomly or as a, what the director chooses. Here we can choose something musical, if the next course will be electric or acoustic. Let's say I go acoustic. So the band members pick up acoustic instruments and play it acoustically. I founded the company with my band, so everybody you see here are active members of the company also. Now Wait, we can choose. This, does this go to the? Is this online? Wait, somewhere? just now you choose uh, which which one you want to take the solo. I'll choose weirdo because you haven't chosen. It's all in real time. So, so is now it's online. Like people can they go to it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Each one has his own uh, dance and his own instrument playing. Now, because I'm a musician and I have a big ego, I did that the last choice, you have no choice. No matter what you do, it goes back to me. Now, because everything happens in real time, the sum of my choices is actually the video, the, the version of the video I've created. And now I can share it on Facebook or download the version that I've made. It depends on what people want to do. But what happened is that we we started doing some projects and we found out that people are sharing it three times or four times more than they do on, on YouTube and that uh, people view the, the video three times in a row before leaving the video when in YouTube they don't even get to 70% of the length of the video. And the most important thing is that 90% of the people make choices in real time and don't let the, not letting the computer make the choices for them. So I don't just get people to watch the video three times, which for a musician is great, but also for anyone that wants uh, exposure. But I also know that the person is actually uh, paying attention to the video all the time. And then an advertiser came to me and told me that it's also interesting to know what people have chose. And now it's, it, it got an, a lot of attention from advertisers, but I still try to make this also for music videos. Um, we got funded a month ago by Sequoia, and I, I think we, we are also doing an uh, iOS version for it, um, because choosing like this is great, and we're also doing a collaboration with Xbox Kinect, so you can choose from your sofa like this or like is this. It, is it technology? Have you got a technology there that you, you patented or something? Yeah, yeah, we, pa we have four big patents, and the technology itself is, this is our own video format, which is the only a uh, video codec that can play seamlessly uh, in progressive download, if you know what that means. But mm -hmm. the idea is that no other, because nobody tried to do it before, there's no uh, way to play videos. This is chopped up video because you don't feel it in the end. You feel like you're watching one big video. So when you, if I send it to my friends and I send it to them on an iPad, is it HTML5 compatible? Or yeah, it's the, the player itself here, what I've just shown is, is uh, Flash, but our codec works with any uh, platform works already on, on web-based Flash and on Androids. 
And are you a coder? Are you like a, a code person? Like, how did you co you came up with the idea? Obviously, because you're an artist and you're very very popular in Israel. I mean, yeah, he's actually a huge rock star in Israel. So, you know, we're we're looking at rock Israel. Star. is very small. <laughs> But Israel's very small. Yeah. But uh, I, know, my, my what, well, how did you come up with the idea? Like, what, what, did you sit down one day and say, you know, I need to do this, and got together with a coder friend and decided? No, to first of all, my guitar player is a coder, and I was my my dad is a physicist, a physicist, right? It's not a doctor one, not physician. No, yeah, physicist. I always mix them up. So he's a physicist, and my mom is an artist. So my mom bought me a piano when I was five, and my dad gave me an internet account when I was six. <laughs> so I didn't have a lot of friends in high school. <laughs> And because I played classical music and hacked girls. into computers. I can see why. Not where I came from, <laughs> yeah. No, th they didn't like that kind. Yeah. So, you know, I had a background for both um, music and computers. And I just, I, I thought this is such a simple idea. It, it has a lot of development taken into it because it wasn't a How simple. How long did it take to develop? Um, about to get to this version, about a year and a half. Um, and can you, can you talk, can you get a little geek on us? Can you talk about the technology? Is it... Is it, you know, what codecs are you using? How does it? It's our own codec, both for video and audio. Um, the only one that plays seamlessly, you can't feel uh, where the stitching points are because whenever you find out where the stitching points, the magic uh, disappears because the whole idea is that no matter what choice or what combination you make, um, it feels seamless. And the first uh, thing we did was in Israel with the Israeli version of American Idol, we had more than a million, we, we had like the 21 final contestants all sing the same um, audition song about it's my turn to be the star and you could start with him and then she joins and then anything, have, it was an interactive song. Wow. And we had more than a million unique visitors. Can we see it? Do you have it with you? No, it's online and I don't oh. have an online connection here. Okay. But I can send links afterwards to everybody. Well, we'll put a link up on Twitter uh, if everybody wants. Can, can we put one up, Sue, when we get a link to that for him? I can um, send it. Yeah, if you want to send it to us or just pop it up on Twitter, we'll retweet it so everyone can see it. Cool, I it's will. It's absolutely fascinating. Like, uh, it's fantastic. I, I saw you present in New York, so I now know because you know Yaron, right? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I saw you present at NYB. Yeah. I was blown away then, and it's it's great. Now, thank you very much for bringing Thank you. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> can, you ask, can you answer uh, one question? I think we got a question out here. Yeah. Let me just, just move on up. Yeah, we are, we are licensing the technology. We did uh, some uh, projects already with Old Navy and Microsoft and Nokia, and now we're doing a big one with AOL, which is, a, we're doing an interactive series. Awesome. We're doing a really cool interactive, uh, like people that license the technology, um, that uh, each epi it's 10 episodes, 10 minutes each. Uh, every episode, a different celebrity goes into a room with a fortune teller, and she tells him he has 24 hours to live. And then you choose how he spends his last day of life, and and each way he dies in a, a gruesomely different way, which is really cool. <laughs> if you don't like that celebrity. In the beginning, we're doing just projects because we can charge. Um, very high licensing it, fees. I mean, you shot for one night. So how much did that video? That video cost like three thousand dollars. But it's because video costs go down these days. So you know, I'm I'm shooting twenty five percent more than than the regular one. But I, I got but three times. But how long did it take to shoot? One night. One night. So, but you had two hundred and fifty six versions. Yeah, but it's it's the sum of twenty one scenes. Twenty one. Because it's combinations. It's yeah. yeah. So, okay, exactly. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I on the Israeli version of American Idol, we did it was shot in five hours, and there were a billion versions because it was 21 singers, 11 cutting points. You can do the math. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Thanks very much. Thanks. All right, cheers. Big round of applause. <laughs> you guys will just let me know if I'm geeking out too much because I love I like the technologies. Like, I could spend an hour just talking about what do you mean by the codec? Like, what sort of code were you using? Um, but I won't go down that road. But if you want me to, let me know. Just ask a question. The, the where? Yeah, the hat guy's gone. I'm sorry. And he, I, this is the stuff he should have been here for, but I sent him away. I really am awful. I suck. All right. Next, I want to. I've. Um, I met. I have never met Austin yet, but I think I'm very, very interested in what's happening after Facebook. Um, uh, if you're 13 years old and you can't get on, uh, you're 13 and under, you can't get on Facebook. We know there's a lot of 11 and 12 year olds. But I don't want to be, if I'm 11 or 12 or 13, I don't want to be anywhere where my grandmother is or my mother is. 
okay? Now, there's privacy settings that are going on Facebook that it goes against everything in terms of monetization. So I'm extremely interested in private social networks and how they're run. Um, Austin, I, I'm, I'm gonna let, you t let him tell you about it, but when we heard about it, we, I, I, I immediately said, can we get him over here? So he has something called Fridge. It's a private social network. I'm gonna let him talk about it, but um, it's a great idea, and I think they're possibly gonna take over. Austin? Hello? Hey. I'm here to talk to you about the Fridge and really how it's all about the context, how people engage with each other today my name's Austin. I'm actually, I am familiar with TV. I am a previous media executive. I was at MTV for numerous years. But I built Fridge, and Fridge are simple private groups for you to share your photos, your videos, your events with specific friends. And generally that's around a specific thing called social context. Now what is it? Well, let's take a step back. While at MTV, I oversaw and directed like the strategy and development division for MTV's digital department. And we noticed a few things for the people that tuned into our television shows. For example, on this television show, Tuesday, 9 p.m., everyone loved turning into the hills. What we noticed is that conversation around this TV show didn't happen the, the day later at the water cooler. Even after the show on discussion boards, forums, actually it happened during the show. It happened during the show on SMS, on IM. People would have viewing parties to get together to do what? To gossip, to talk about the show in real time. So what do we do? We created this thing called Back Channel. I think Kevin Slavin from Area Codes probably talked about this, but what this really did was it created a two-screen experience that brought people together at the same time while watching a TV show. And this is kind of this light social game. What it did was let people chat, say the wittiest, funniest, snarkiest comments in real time commenting on the show. It wasn't based on their friends that they would SMS or IM with. It was actually random people that they tuned in to watch a television show together with. And what this was, the social context for this game was the hills. Everyone there, tens of thousands of people would actually go together Tuesdays at 9 p.m. and actually watch this show and collaborate and play together. Now what this did was so this made Tuesdays at 9 p.m. an event again. It made it so people would want to come together, watch a TV show, and they wouldn't time shift, they'd want to go there. Now this was a few years ago, and now the internet is everywhere, and people brands, media, television shows, they know they have to go where their fans are, go where their friends actually are. Now here's a, here's a Facebook page of MTVs. They have almost 10,000 fans for Jersey Shore. They're also on Twitter, really big, like 1.2 million followers. But how is MTV actually utilizing these, these platforms? How are they actually engaging with these almost 10 million Facebook fans, 1.2 million Twitter fans? Are they really actually converting these people these, into eyeballs for 9 p.m. on Tuesdays? Or are people actually interacting differently online nowadays? Do they not want this, you know, this broadcast model? Well, let's take a look. Their hope is that one person will share it with six of their friends, and then those six friends will share it with six more friends, and so on and so forth. And the hope is that that graph on the left turns into that graph on the right. That's what every marketer really wants. But are people really engaging that way? If you take a look online, your friends are kind of clustered like this. You know, average person has 140, 130 Facebook friends. But then they're all kind of lumped together. Your real friends group together with your mom, group together with your ex-college buddies, your old roommate, or maybe even your boss, God forbid. How are you gonna actually gonna separate these relationships? These relationships are actually defined one-to-one -one with based on a friend request, but there's no differentiation. There's no hierarchy between them. In real life, friend graphs generally look like this. Now these slides are from Paul Adams, an ex-Google researcher. He said, People generally have you know, four to six groups of friends. You have your family group, your college group, maybe your friends based on where you live in New York, or maybe your surfing buddies based on like, an interest that you share. And so people generally interact with these things, but each group, they don't interact with each other. Your friends group don't necessarily interact with your New York buddies and don't interact with your, your family. So they're generally fairly separate. Right? On top of that, within each group, there's closeness of relationship. Relationships that you have that are closer with you generally with only very few people, maybe two to six folks, and everyone else are weaker ties, and everyone else after that, just temporariness, right? So based on this model, how do people actually engage? How do you actually have content that filters through your network? How do you socially engage with these people? Let's take an example. In real life, if you're with, your, with college buddies, it's pretty easy to get together. Maybe once, twice a month you get together, go to a local pub, or maybe once a year you have your college reunion. You know that everyone that's coming together there 
is from that same context, your social circle from college. Share your inside jokes, those embarrassing photos, those stories. You know that it'll all probably stay within that circle, right? But online, that graph on the right, it's really hard to pick out that specific group, that group of college friends. Sure, you can kind of segment them, select them into a separate group on Facebook. You can then hope that the people then self-select and don't invite other people into there. Those photos, embarrassing stories, are you sure that it's gonna stay within that context? Because in that group, as you can see, it's mushed up with everyone else there. And as Facebook goes to a billion people, how do you know that, how you can be sure and safe that those contexts still stay relevant? We're in the middle of witnessing a paradigm shift. We know that digital experiences are intertwined with everyone's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. But people are moving away from a simple sharing model, simple social sharing, broadcasting out to everyone, and actually moving towards more personalized, relevant context and content. And what that is, that means that today's social media tools need to keep up with that, need to catch up. They need to let people engage in the way they do in real life, what they do in those basic scenarios when you get together with people. And what brings these people together? And I'm arguing, I'm saying, it's probably social context. And there's three main types of ways people will interact together in social context based on these relationships. The first and foremost one is, is personal and private things. As we said, college kids, well, they can be college kids, right? They can share those inside jokes, share those inside moments, and not worry that their, their future boss or their mom finds out how they spend their tuition money. Or, you know, family, close friends, they'll share your, your family photos, those vacations with uh, long-lost relatives, or keep in touch on a day-to-day -day basis, have intimate conversations. Personal and private relationships is probably one of the main important reasons why people interact together with each other, that social context. The second type of social context are based on shared interests, shared experiences, whether it's you know, the esoteric interests of a Star Wars fan club, or maybe the cat lovers of Anonymous, or maybe it's even a group of buddies that want to get together every month for a dinner club, exploring what the next best restaurant in New York is, or if I'm traveling on vacation. It's that specific shared interest, esoteric topics, groups. The third one, which is actually picking up a lot, is actually temporary things, such as events, like in a, a wedding event. A bunch of people come together beforehand, the pre-planning, the organizing, the trips. During the event, those conversations, the stories, inside jokes, and afterward, the networking and sharing. These temporary events, much like this conference here today, brings people together in a temporary pop-up network. And as mobile becomes more and more important, location becomes that next kind of temporary pop-up network where with a mobile phone, you can engage with people who are in your immediate vicinity five minutes from now, five minutes before, even five days from now, five days before, you can actually experience, interact with these people because you share that same social context. So social context, generally these relationships bucket into three parts. Personal, those family, friends, those personal private conversations, interest-based uh, groups, social context around clubs, esoteric interests that you share, and temporary events, locations. And as all of these different experiences, these different relationships start to connect e to each other, you start to see very interesting things. You see a social graph that turns from this into this. You start to build clustered social graphs. And as these graphs start to overlap, you start to have more and more relationships. This becomes much more interesting than a direct one-to-one -one friend request Facebook social graph. It's a clustered social graph. And that graph starts to have overlapping groups and starts to look like this graph, which we said every marketer really wants to have. So at Fridge, we are emphasizing specific interests and experiences around social context, those families, the location-based things, weddings, university, whatever you want. Just like the Fridge you have back at home, where your mom would put your homework with a gold star on it, family photos were there, you'd leave notes or lists for other people, you can create these Fridge networks for any sort of social context, those personal private relationships, those interest-based specific topics that you want to share, as well as those temporary pop-up networks like events and location. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. If you want to quickly grab a mic, I'd love to ask you a few questions. Don't kick over the water. <laughs> um, I, just give me an idea of like, uh, what, what made you think uh, that, that this was important? And I, I guess we could also talk a bit about how you're going to monetize it. Do you want to talk about some of those things? Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's on. It really was a bunch of our friends wanted to get together and plan their skiing trip, right? Snowboarding trip every year, a bunch of college buddies. There's no good way to organize them. How do you coordinate these itineraries? How do you travel plans? What hotels do you want to stay at? Hey, I'm coming in this day. No, I don't want to spend that much money. And so there's no good way to do that. You're not going to use Facebook to have these actually very detailed 
interest-based questions. Actually, even during the event, a lot of our friends couldn't make it. So I'm not going to broadcast out, hey, you missed a crazy day that everyone feels like I'm showing off, which a lot of people like to do. But then afterwards, how do you share those moments and, st and events and those inside stories that you wouldn't necessarily mean nothing? It gets lost in the noise and clutter. So it really evolved from a, a bunch of buddies going on a snowboarding trip. So what do you think, is Facebook, are you on their radar? Or are they looking at you? Or? Well, it's interesting. We launched this. We're actually a Y Combinator funded, really a bunch of angels and uh, VCs have backed us. Uh, we launched probably September last year. Right away in October, Facebook launched their Facebook group. So it's a very interesting model of how we interact. We're all about that social context. We're all about helping you organize, plan, and share those specific groups. And the privacy side of things. Like, wh What's your feeling on Facebook's privacy issues? I, I don't get it. I mean, I, you see Facebook, they have almost like this Rube Goldberg contraption of dials and levers. I have no idea actually how yeah, to How control. many people actually are using the privacy settings effectively on Facebook? Effectively, I said, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we actually take face, uh, privacy straight out of the equation. Like groups, they're no longer privacy-based or permission-based. They're all social context-based. If we wanted to create a group just for MIT, we could bring everyone together, meet each other, introduce each other. But it's a private group. It's just for MIP. But MIP has, what, 10,000 attendees? But can anyone join? Only, th that's up to the group owner. The group owner can be like, hey, everyone come in. Or even ha here's a specific link. When we tweet it out to it, if you're interested in it, you can join. Or it can be just for your family reunion, the, the 100 people that are going to, you know, going to New York to meet for a family reunion. It can be that small, that large. We take privacy straight out of it. It's just around that context. Great presentation. Thanks so much. Cheers. All right, let's uh, move. We want to keep this moving along. Uh, next up is Alexander Young uh, from SoundCloud, and he's going to talk a bit about SoundCloud and, and how he developed it and everything like that. Go ahead. All right, cool. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm a founder and the CEO of SoundCloud.com. Um, it's a large scale online audio platform allowing creators to share their sounds across the web. Um, so, one thing that I wanted to talk a little about a little bit about today is basically this. The web today is mute, uh, which is kind of sad. Um, if, you, if you're like me, you probably spend a lot of time on the web. Um, it's a fantastic, awesome place, uh, like no other. Um, you have a lot of text, you have a lot of videos, you have a lot of images, and all of these things make up what, what, uh, what the web is today. A lot of it is user-generated. Um, so large parts of the content on the web, which make it what it is, is made by the users. And if you look at it, we have, we've been producing a lot of text, we've been producing a lot of uh, videos, and we've been producing a lot of photos. But somehow, like sound really hasn't sort of hit that same kind of point that uh, videos, text, and photos has. So when I look at the web today, I really feel like it's a mute experience. It's very silent. You know, the web is a large part of my life. In my everyday life, outside of the web, there's sounds everywhere. But that hasn't really translated yet. Um, additionally, I think that, you know, what's happened on the web with things like YouTube, Flickr, Twitter, and stuff like that, that's helped people become very good at creating and sharing content in different forms. And that, on a general level, has helped people's literacy levels uh, across these different mediums. So people understand photos, they understand videos much better than they did five years ago. And so with SoundCloud, basically what we're trying to do is that we're trying to raise the overall literacy level for people across the world in how they, uh, how they understand how to communicate through sound, how to be able to create, share, and read sound. Um, across the world. So how can you do that? Um, we have uh, a web app um, and a couple of mobile apps, a uh, desktop app. So you can use SoundCloud across a couple of different platforms. Uh, this is a screen from our mobile application, which is available on, on iOS and Android. Um, and it does a whole bunch of neat little things, but this is my favorite part. Um, it's a screen with one button. Um, so every one of you basically is carrying around a microphone in your pocket. Uh, that's the ears uh, of your world. Uh, with this app, you have one button so that you can capture an interesting sound wherever you are. No matter if you're a guitarist and you want to capture that, uh, that musical idea, or if you're a journalist, you want to capture that interview, or if you're just a person who wants to send an audio tweet out to the world. You always have the button with you, and you basically just record, you share, and then it hits the web. Um, it's as simple as that. 
Um, it's a free app, so if you want to check it out, just search for SoundCloud at your local app store and you'll find it. Um, an example of how you can use that is Tara and Tyler, a Canadian couple that have been spending some time traveling through Europe lately. Um, they, they're riding their bikes across Europe, so they're taking their time. Uh, they run a website called Going Slowly, where they document this process. Um, they write blog posts, they take videos, uh, they take photos, and they record sounds. Um, all of this is also geotagged, so they can plot everything on a map, so you can follow along with their trip, um, hear the things that they're hearing, see the things that they're seeing, seeing and, and read what, what they feel about it. Um, and it's a really nice, um, I, th I think they're getting close to the end of the trip now, but it's been a really nice, uh, a really nice ride. Um, so we have users like that that could be using the, the iPhone application. Um, we have about four million um, different kind of creators. Um, so it's a lot of different people creating a lot of different kind of sounds on the platform. So it's not just people like Tara and Tyler. Uh, we have also maybe more known artists, like um, some of these guys also, Foo Fighters, The Beatles, um, things like that. Uh, also things like this, um, record labels that use it for uh, all different kinds of music. Um, and you may think that they're quite different, right? Universal versus Beck versus Tara and Tyler. But what's the common thing for all of these is that they're all creators. They all create sound in different kind of ways and different forms. And they're all looking to share that with other people. And I think what's really interesting now with, for instance, this mobile application that we have is that anybody can basically be a creator of sound content. So every single person in this room, um, I hope, at some point will feel as comfortable expressing themselves through sounds and sharing sounds as you are already with taking photos. Um, Another cool thing which is happening is that the world of music specifically, so music as a specific type of sound, has changed insane amounts over the last 10 years, um, especially when looking at the tool sets for making music. Um, everybody kind of knows that you, know, the, the, you don't need a massive big studio anymore, like everybody has GarageBand on their, on their MacBook. But even sort of beyond that, GarageBand is still a fairly complex application, which requires a lot of skill to make music. Uh, but what's really cool now is that there's a ton of applications out there that allows anybody in this room to pick them up and make a piece of music without any skills in about 30 seconds. So 30 seconds to make a piece of music. You're, you're approaching the, experience, uh, the, the kind of experience of taking a photo, again, like I like that analogy. Um, it's as simple, basically, as that. So with these different applications, no matter if they're mobile apps or tablet apps or desktop apps, it's basically taking everybody in this room and from today on, you're basically a musician. And I think that's a super cool thing because um, in general, I think that uh, creating is a lot cooler than consuming. So write is a lot cooler than read. And if you look at what's happened across the web with stuff like, uh, like Twitter and uh, YouTube and Flickr, like they've all kind of gotten, they've all arrived at this point where creation becomes so simple and they plug sharing into that. And you have very simple creation and very easy sharing and those two things together can create very large phenomenons. So we're looking at the world and seeing that, okay, 30 seconds for anybody to, to create a piece of music. SoundCloud is a platform for being able to share that with the entire world um, across any web platform. So we think that those two things together is something that's going to make, uh, make quite an impact. So, um, okay, this dude, 50. Um, sorry, so all of you are basically musicians now, um, uh, which is pretty cool. So, but you might not be as cool as this guy. Um, I don't think anybody in this room is as cool as this guy. He's probably the coolest one here. Um, but the cool thing about the web is that um, it allows people to interact in very fun ways. So you just became a musician, and we're just going to get an invite here from 50 Cent that he's recorded to ask you to produce a track for him. Um, so let's see. I've highlighted some of the words here. Let's see if we get some sound yeah, on this. Yeah. All right. This right here is for the producers. I do this because I love it. Just a sample. Let's see if I can paint a picture for you right quick. Got a little kick drum playing. Y'all finish it for me. Gotta use your imagination now. <laughs> I imagine I was broke right now. Sitting down right. on my 
So, so this is a track that 50 put up uh, about a week ago or something. Um, he just went into the studio and he recorded some rhymes. You can hear that there's a little bit of background track, but not much. And as you hear in the beginning, he's, in, he's doing this for all the producers out there. And his, uh, his question is basically, you know, take this track, produce it for me, and send it back to me, and let's see if we're going to release it. So it's a pretty cool day, huh? You all became musicians right away, and you got invited by 50 Cent to actually make a track with him. So um, so far, I think there's been two or 3,000 tracks um, produced for him. and. Um, they just keep coming in. So I would encourage anybody to take this cool 50 track and uh, try to make a new version out of it. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to say today. I, I want to like live with just kind of like one, uh, one thing. Um, just really think about it. Like the world around you is full of amazing sounds. Um, everybody, everybody here, um, you, 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 you all have the abilities to be able to create, capture, and share those cool sounds around you. Um, so let's do that, and let's try and unmute the web. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks very much. Cheers. Um, one quick question for you. If you want to just grab a mic, we're gonna, they're going to pull off here, and we're going to get Tim up from Sony. Just one quick question. So you've got two or 3,000 tracks coming in. Yeah. How are they moderating that? Like, is, is someone actually sitting down and listening to all this? So one, someone's from 50s so world? Uh, so they can set it up in two different ways. So you can have either ev either an open submission form where just anything can be sent in, which is what they're doing in this case, um, or you can have something where you have to approve every track before it actually uh, comes out. So um, let me see an example. There's there's another project that G Unit are doing as well, where people submit the tracks that they've made, and then once a week a track gets featured on the 50 Cent site. Okay. That's a moderated group. So there they will go through, listen to them, and choose the cool ones, and then uh, approve those. It's fantastic. Hope everyone can use SoundCloud. Thanks very much, Alexander. Vander. Thanks. Okay, uh, we got two more left. They're great. We're gonna get Tim right up here from Sony Pictures Ultraviolet. Um, great, thanks. And I'm gonna let him just, or do you want to take your, your okay, you're going to get your laptop. I've seen Tim's presentation. It's fantastic what Sony's doing. Um, uh, some really interesting ideas about, can I say cloud? Am I, am I allowed to say cloud? Okay, there's some cloud stuff going on, so that's a buzzword. If you're playing uh, conference bingo, I said cloud. I also said gamification earlier. <laughs> Who's got gamification? Did we, what? Oh, they do. We were going to make a whole app that was, have you guys played conference bingo before where you go to these conferences and people will say the same words, especially if you go to a marketing conference. I went to a marketing conference. Everyone got up and said ecosystem. Everyone said, um, like, uh, was gamification. So you make a bingo. Uh, don't even worry about it. Here's Tim. Cool. Great. Thank you. I just have 10 minutes and too many slides, so I will whip through them. Um, so the context, very simple graph. We're not doing as well on, on paid content as we should be doing. That was brought up by an earlier speaker today. We can do better. We can take more advantage of being in a connected world, and that's what Ultraviolet is all about. So these, this is a partial list of the nearly 70 companies involved in um, Ultraviolet. You might have heard of it as called DECE, Digital Entertainment Content Ecosystem but the consumer name is Ultraviolet. So we've got five of the six major studios there. We have Lionsgate. We have a very good range of um, retailers, technology companies, and uh, I think a very wide range of the audiovisual sector covered. It's not just a studio move at all. There's a very wide range of companies covered here. A good range of mobile companies there, good range of CE companies there. Um, and the aim is, for a, is to get an open marketplace for electronic sell through, for selling content online. And we're aiming for DVD-like level -like levels of interoperability and ease of use and accessibility, but for a connected world, for a connected changing environment. And we believe that ultraviolet is going to be the standard for ownership of video content in a connected world. That's the aim. Um, so what, what, you know, how does the user get it? What do they do? Um, so that logo that you can see at the bottom left is key. Um, users like logos. And the logo has to stand for something, and I'll talk more about that later. So the user will see the logo on, uh, maybe they'll go to one of those retail parks and buy a Blu-ray or a DVD, or maybe they'll, they'll be online 
and they'll see the ultraviolet logo there, and they buy some content that's ultraviolet content. That will take them to their ultraviolet account, so the cloud, the digital locker. Each user will have a digital locker account, which is theirs. It's not attached to a particular retailer like iTunes or Amazon. Um, it's, their, it's their locker account. And they will put that content that they bought into their locker. So they now have it for good now. If they change service provider, they stop using a particular service provider, they don't lose their content because it's in their digital locker. Uh, and once it's in your locker, you can then watch it wherever you are. You can download it onto your devices, up to 12 of your devices. You can share it with up to five other users in your account. And you can stream it wherever you are. So it's very flexible in terms of how you can use it. And kind of an unprecedented in terms of the flexibility which the content owners are allowing people to have here. Um, so as we said, you get three kind of sets of rights. You get the right to share it with six users and 12 devices. You can stream it wherever you are, and you get a physical, cop physical copy option as well. Some people like to keep a physical copy, and they can do that. Um, what shall I pick out here? Um, I guess the thing I want to pick out here is we're aiming for a consistent approach here. At the moment, there are a huge variety of different video-on-demand and electronic sell-through offers. And we think that users are really confused about that. They don't know what they're getting. And ultraviolet is about enabling people to, to understand what they're getting. And so they've got the confidence to, to keep on shopping and buying stuff instead of pirating it or, or just not buying it. Um, we've done some market research. The kind of especially high affinity sectors are families with teens and kids, 18 to 34 year olds, and then existing Blu-ray renters and buyers. And people have said they will change behavior for ultraviolet. So they will switch from one content retailer to another. They will buy content as opposed to renting it a higher proportion of time. And people buying things rather than renting it is, is, uh, you know, is better for the industry because the margins for the industry are better there. We're not saying people can't rent content. We just want people to buy content a bit more than they do at the moment. And people have said they will pay a little more. They'll pay $1 to $2 more for the ultraviolet sell-through offer over a non-ultraviolet sell-through offer. So that's pretty positive. Um, this is kind of industry view. Uh, that's not such an interesting slide. Those are the different roles which industry can take. So industry, you could be a content provider. Maybe there's some content owners here. You would take the content provider role. There's two sorts of customer-facing role. One is the retailer, and they are the people who actually sell an ultraviolet title. So they would sell you the social network as an ultraviolet right. And then the streaming service provider would be the um, entity that would actually stream it to you. Now, some people say, well, why would anybody stream you a film that you have bought from someone else? Who would do that? And we think a lot of people would do that. We think you know, big websites will do that just to get more eyeballs coming to them. We think that um, connectivity providers like ISPs and pay TV providers will do that to get people to stay with you or to move up to a higher tier of service. You know, you move up to our premium service and then stream all your ultraviolet titles. Um, so we think a lot of people will go for that streaming service provider role. The download service provider role is a kind of technology provider role. And then we've got the client role and we've got the coordinator at the bottom. I shall zip through. Here we go. Very quickly, um, a bit of codex stuff for you there. We're building on the industry standard codex. So importantly, Ultraviolet does not need any specific hardware, so many existing devices can be updated to be ultraviolet compliant. And also, we're standardizing a single content file format. So at the moment, the content industry is, um, I was going to say, um, I'm trying to think of the word that's not pissing, so let's just say pissing. We're pissing away stacks of money on content transcoding that we don't need to. You know, companies get paid to transcode a film, the same film, 20 times for 20 different providers, total waste of money. And we're, getting, we're doing away with that by having a single content file format for this ecosystem. Um, Timescales, we're launching in the middle of the year. We will launch in this summer in the States and then later in Canada and the UK this year. And then further territories will be announced and in terms of kind of mirroring interactivity, for further territories, we aim to be responsive. So if France says, we really like ultraviolet, uh, nous adorons ultraviolet, then, um, then France will come up the pecking order. 
Whereas if Germany says, no, we love it, we want it now, I don't know the German for we love it, um, we'll launch in Germany for, rather than France. So we aim to be responsive in the further territories. A um, couple of options, you can join or you can not join. Um, response, very good response. People like it, people say this is what EST needs. And then in terms of innovation, since this is innovation panel, we standardize certain things. We standardize the usage model so the user knows what they're getting. We standardize some of the infrastructure elements, and that is aiming to bring some market dynamics into infrastructure. You're not wedded to your technology provider with ultraviolet because you can swap your technology provider more easily now. So some things we standardize, but most things we don't, enabling people to bring in innovation, the user interface, the user experience, the business model, how user, user interaction is started, many things for innovation to come in. And I guess the... Sure, do. Is there, um, can I have this mic here? Um, is it backward compatible? Is it, uh, is, it, you know, you guys are basically launching a whole other format, but the format seemed to be changing so quickly. How are you keeping up? Sure. So the, the backward compatibility, I would say, is provided by the fact that you can stream. So you don't need a particular ultraviolet device to stream your content. And it's also linked to Blu-rays and DVDs, so it picks that up as well. In terms of forward compatibility... Tim, I'm just going to get you to move over. Oh. We're going to set up uh, Michael. Okay, cool. In terms of forward compatibility, one thing we could do is... So 3D is not part of this. So let's say you buy Avatar as an ultraviolet offer. Maybe in a couple of years' time when we add 3D in, um, a service provider could say, well, look, you've already bought Avatar. Um, you don't have to buy it again to get 3D. Why don't you just pay a small upsell and we'll give you the 3D version. So we see it as... Very forward compatible, and that's something which annoys people. People say, I'm not buying Blu-ray because I've got the DVD. I should get the Blu-ray for free. And uh, with Ultraviolet, we can kind of edge towards that. Can I ask you quickly, while Marco's getting set up, about Android? Sure. How, y y it's obviously going to work across all platforms, mm -hmm. right? We're hearing a lot of pushback on Android. It's growing really quickly. A lot of people are using it, but it's, there's, developers are having a lot of problems with it. It requires lots of different phones. How are you guys dealing with that? from a format standpoint? Because you're in the cloud, so how are you going to deal with that? I think we would, we've got open standards, so I think we'd be relying on some kind of key developers to come forward with really good toolkits. And, you know, a lot of good companies are working on providing good toolkits for Android. So I think, you know, that's what I'd hope for on that front. Great presentation. Thanks very much, Tim. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, up next, uh, to end it all off, uh, Michael Schneider. Most of you may know him uh, from Mobile Roadie. He created the Mint Markets app that you are using uh, every day. Um, he has a fantastic overview, he showed it to me earlier, of just what's going on on mobile. So he's going to bring everything together, our last presentation of the day, and just give us a good insight on what's happening in mobile, what he thinks is important. I've seen him do presentations before. It's great. Do not disappoint me. <laughs> Pressure. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so I'm the only one not talking about my own company, and uh, I created this presentation days ago, and Tommy came in here and stole a little bit of my thunder, so thanks a lot, Tommy. Um, before I begin, I want to know how many people in this room have a smartphone, an iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry? Just put your hand up. Raise your hand if you don't have a smartphone. They're not going to do that. They no, one guy did. Nice. What kind of not smartphone do you have? Awesome. You know what, I have a lot of respect, a lot of props for you, man. That's going to be the one guy that's paying attention to my presentation because 95% of you are going to check your smartphone while I'm talking. It doesn't matter how interesting I am. The other 5% will want, will want to. Um, a lot of us go through our day and we feel like this. Uh, we're never focusing on one thing. We're pulled in two different directions. And uh, have you ever had a situation like this? You're out with a friend, you're hanging out, but you're not really hanging out. Uh, someone's texting, someone's calling. This happens all the time. It starts young, and it happens at lunch and dinner, and the issue has come to a boiling point so much that TechCrunch, a very popular tech blog, uh, MG Siegler was out to dinner with his mother, and his mother kept getting mad at him for checking his phone over and over at dinner, and she thought it was rude, and this was the result. I will check my phone at dinner, and you will deal with it. Uh, he got a lot of flack for that, and someone was saying, how could you do that to your mom? But the point is very real. Uh, we're often in two, two different places at a time. So, uh, as uh, Tommy stole from me, we live in a two-screen world. And this is an actual photo that I took at a Lady Gaga concert in Berlin last year. And look at that. I don't know, maybe a third of the audience, this isn't a scientific study, 
has something glowing in their hand, a mobile device, taking pictures, tweeting, taking video, sharing with their friends. It doesn't seem like it's real anymore unless we're tweeting about it, unless we're sharing it. This is gone. This, these days are completely gone. And it, we've gone from this to that. That's the reality today. Um, here is a real life example that just happened last month, and I hope the sound works. You can really watch the Oscars. For the first time ever, you'll have online access to more than 20 cameras that will show a lot of behind the scenes activities at the Academy Awards show. So let's bring in our digital lifestyle expert, Mario Armstrong, to explain some of this for us. Uh, Mario, happy Saturday to you. Uh, happy Saturday does, to you too, Randy. How does this whole Oscar online viewing work? Yeah, so here's the deal. The Oscars are like, hey, look, th we want to make sure that the Oscars are more accessible. So basically, you log on, they have a brand new website at oscar.go.com. Brand new website that's been recently launched. Uh, they also have a new mobile app that you can download from the iTunes store. So you can use that on your iPod Touch, your iPhone, or on your iPad. Uh, and so all of this digital activity is about them trying to make, I think, the show more relevant and give you more access. And as you mentioned, you'll have up to 24 different video cameras, video streams, video feeds that you can look at. Everything from the red carpet to the behind the scenes and backstage reactions of the winners all the way to uh, their mm -hmm. after parties and some of their events. See, now hearing this, I think a lot of people are going to be set up. They're going to have their big screen, you know, plasma That's TV right. somewhere. <laughs> then they're going to have their computer going, That's their right. Twitter going. <laughs> It's going to be quite a scene. So you think they're doing this just to, to get it more attention? Well, I think, you know, if you really look at the ratings over the past few years, especially in 2008, there was a severe dip in viewership. And we are seeing more of what we're calling this two-screen experience, where people are watching television, but they're also using their laptop or their tablets or phones as a part of a companion viewing so that you can do social, social watching together. You can tweet. You can follow hashtags. You can be engaged. In fact, with uh, the live streaming with the Oscars this year, you'll also be able to ask questions that can be a uh, asked on the red carpet by some of the hosts. So two things struck me about this. One, it's pretty cool that I get to have my own Oscars experience and get to control the cameras, 24 different cameras behind the stage, and uh, have my own experience. Two, CNN has a digital lifestyle expert. This stuff is so complicated, apparently, that they bring in this guy and give him a fancy title. I'm sure he got a PhD in that subject. And I think in two or three years, that's just going to be a reporter talking about a new app or a new experience. This is reality, but it's so foreign today, that's what happens. A uh, little context on mobile. Again, uh, thanks a lot, Tommy. Uh, four breaths a second, 39 mobile phones sold every single second. Obama was inaugurated in January of 2009, 4.2 billion. A uh, year and a half later, he looks a little bit grumpier. There's over 5 billion phones. That's a 20% increase on already a massive number. And the definition of mobile is changing. It used to just mean a phone or a computer. Now we have tablets. Uh, thanks to the iPad, it's exploding. But that's a car. And maybe this is not the best uh, situation for a two-screen experience when you're driving, but that is an actual app store in a Ford automobile today. Mobile apps account for 50% of mobile internet traffic. It's massive. It's a huge number. So what is an app? And this is where Tommy and I uh, disagree a little bit. And I have to disagree because it's a direct conflict of my business. Um, an app is a focus on a brand. So the web can be very distracting. You have links. You have banners. You have other stuff. Uh, there's none of that in an app. It's a very focused experience. And people are doing real business uh, via apps. eBay did $2 billion worth of mobile in 2010. 70% was from their app and 30% was from their mobile website. That's the same exact products. So that means that 800 million more dollars were spent by people using the app. It's a better, exp it's a better buying experience. iPhone users on eBay spent 65 bucks a week. iPad spent 85. Again, same exact experience, bigger screen. The average spend on the iPad was 50% higher than on the website. Um, so that, that, that uh, better user experience really does matter in terms of dollars. Uh, PayPal, another huge player, 25 million in 2008, half a billion last year. There's real dollars flowing through this mobile ecosystem. So um, what does this all mean at a, at a TV conference? Well, it means um, that we need to engage these fans. Um, if you're checking your phone, thank you, Tommy, for the stat, every six and a half minutes, uh, that means that we're not watching the show for a second every six and a half minutes. So what are we doing? Um, well, it, let's take the example of Sex in the City, great HBO series. 
Uh, they have all this merch for sale at HBO.com on their official website, but you may not be going to HBO.com in that uh, every six and a half minute interval. Why not have an app and a mobile experience to be able to sell the merch that accompanies the show that you're actually watching in context in real time? Why should the most active conversation be on Facebook about the show? You, those are your users. If you're producing content, you want to harness that. Again, an app or a mobile experience can do that. Um, what if you take your property into a different direction? There's been two Sex in the City feature films now. Uh, why not sell them tickets? And because the mobile knows where it is, you can actually target people where they are in their community, offering a ticket special or whatever it is you have to offer. And user data. I think this is very um, underappreciated, but at HBO.com you can register. But again, you're probably not going to HBO.com or watching the show. Uh, the mobile experience is a great opportunity to get that user data and use it in your future marketing efforts. So uh, what I want to leave you with today is take control of both screens. There's too much happening on that other screen for you to ignore it. And that old model of uh, the family sitting in front of the 1950s TV is completely gone. And if you want this presentation, that's a link to it. And that's how to get a hold of me. So thank you. Great. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. Great timing. I love you. Awesome. Um, a lot of the presentations are going to be available online. Um, we will be tweeting them out on the Twitter handle. So you can, it's underscore MIP underscore. We'll put it up on there. You've probably also seen that Jumpwire um, Sue is our head of strategy. She's taken over our Jumpwire um, tweet, uh, Twitter handle. So you can use that. You can follow us there. And we're basically, she's going to all the sessions, uh, seeing all sorts of things. So you can follow it there. Um, you know about Simon Staffens. Um, he's doing a lot of tweeting as well, too. Um, there are still, the roundtables are still going on in the uh, Diane room, if you'd like to go and check that out. Um, don't forget tonight um, at 6.15 at the Estrell level in the Palais, we have our Master Keynote Series, uh, sorry, Mastermind Keynote Series with the uh, Hans Vesterberg, the CEO of Ericsson. So I'm going to head over there. So we'll be tweeting from there if you can't make it because you're drinking, but we would love to have you all over there. Was that out loud? No, that's wrong. Um, there's the happy hour quiz at 7 o'clock. Please come to that because someone's going to win a bottle of champagne. It's going to be amazing. Um, I'm going. Um, and uh, I do want to just take a quick moment because we never get to thank these guys. They're, I am English. I am from the U, you know, U.S. and Canada. And I had to come over and work with the French guys. And considering you know, they do such a great job, considering that we are so pushy and such a pain in the ass, that I just want to thank um, Eric, Fred, and Quat. Is that how you say is it says his name? Yeah, that's good. Okay, great. At the back there. So let's give him a big round of applause <laughs> for putting up with us pushy North, North Americans. It's been a great day. Um, I do want to just quickly talk about tomorrow. Um, Robert Terzak will be hosting tomorrow, um, so you, you don't have to put up with me. So do come back. Um, <laughs> everyone's like, I, if this guy's here, I am not coming back. So tomorrow we've got entertainment everywhere, cash in, cash out. Um, we've got video content monetization, lesson learned. I mean, this connected creativity, I got to say, I read through this. It's a fantastic thing. So you're going to learn lots. It's going to move quickly. Um, and I really want to thank you all for coming today and making a great experience. Please Twitter. Please send us information. Please send us how we can make this better. Come up and talk to me. Um, there's Kevin over there. Stand up, Kevin, if you need to get some feedback from our, our team, Jumpwire. Or um, where's Priya? Where's Priya's at the back there. So if you need to give us some feedback, this is the first time that it's being done. And we want, you know, how can we make it better? Is the, is the seating pissing you off? You know, is, is, is everyone too close? Are the TVs outside? We want to know that stuff. Don't be afraid. Again, thanks for a great day. And we'll see you tomorrow. See you at the pub quiz.